church or what's happening now. Where you, motherfucker, are the priest. You understand what's going on, uh, Lisa, yet? You got me all fired up this morning. This That's is right. I ain't fucking around. I was telling Lee about Jewish people. Like, when I see Jew fucking kids. It's true, because all this racism, shit, ain't nobody racist here, but I see life for what the fuck it is. Okay, when I see a Jew. Yeah. Okay, like when I see an East Coast Jew that they're walking all timid. Like walking, looking at the floor. They ain't making eye contact with nobody. And I see a Jew out here. I know a Jew out here is walking around thinking about what a beautiful day it is to be alive. And Jew in New York, yeah. when they get up in the morning, they got that Hasidic hat that looks like Zorro. You know what they're thinking about? <laughs> what are they thinking about? Stabbing a motherfucker. How are they going to take somebody's pennies today? Because they know ten pennies turn into dollars. And dollars turn into... And I was telling Lee the strength of the strength of the fucking Jewish person in this country. Why? You know, listen, man. Uh, every nationality in this, in this country has suffered. Uh, the blacks got brought from Africa to a place they didn't know. The Cubans, the Jews, the Ger Everybody's fucking suffered here. Let me tell you something. When it comes to the Jews, you think of their strength. You think, where's your strength come from as a human being? It comes from what you went through and what you get over. You know, when those Jews were in that fucking basement with no air conditioning on, with fucking tattoos on their arms, with no head, and saw their friends dying, tell me that four of them didn't get together. And say, when we get out of this motherfucker, it's going to be a different world. We're going to teach our children that never again are they going to get fucked in the ass like we did. This is never going to happen again. You tell me. You tell me that that attitude, those, we've even discussed this. I think you and Ari, me and Ari discussed this. The sons of the Holocaust people, mm -hmm. they were tough as fucking, they were tough as nails. Probably, because yeah. Because the anger in their hearts was transferred. You know, what had happened to them. Don't tell me that that, that, because that's what you wake up for every morning. You wake up, you think of those fucking numbers that they put on my grandfather's arm. I got to go out there today and stab a motherfucker because my, you know, I'm mad because some guy is making me move because he dented my car. Think of what your grandfather woke up with in the mornings with those tattoos and he saw those numbers on his wrist and those people yelling at him. So they got strength from somewhere. That's where you get your strength from, brother, is your fucking culture sometimes. Like me, I know my mother stabbed somebody for raping her little sister. It makes me fucking a savage. That's why she had an alias. That's why my mother had an alias. Where you get your strength. I don't even know what the fuck I'm talking about here. <laughs> but I know it's going to be an interesting podcast because Leo and I were talking about the Sterling shit. And... But anyway, let's open up with some beautiful fucking... It's a beautiful day to be alive. I had a great time in Baltimore. What a great fucking city. I met Speaking of cool black people... Black people running shit in Baltimore. <laughs> Donald Sterling would be dead by now if he made those remarks <laughs> in Baltimore. They don't fuck around in Baltimore, man. They really no. don't. And uh, it's a really interesting city. I was telling Rogan on the on the ride to the thing that when I first got into comedy, there was only two clubs that gave me love. And there was the club Joey's in Detroit, and this club in Baltimore that was just a beat fucking hole. And it was like beat up black people and beat up white people. It was the refuge of the city that nobody wanted. And this guy would put me up, man, two weeks a month, you know, on the weekend and put me in a hotel. And I wasn't good at all. You know, I wasn't good. I was a little dirty and I was from New York, so he liked me up front. But he gave me a lot of work. But I remember what Baltimore looked like. And it looked like a bomb fucking hit it. And now it's it's beautiful. The, the downtown waterfront oh, area? it's yeah. fucking beautiful. It really is. It really, really fucking is beautiful. I had a nice time. The people, the fucking show. You know, it was 2,000 people, and after we got out there, and the line was from here to fucking Lancashire. Jeez. And we took pictures, and we were there until midnight, and uh, it's just very nice to be a part of something as a comedian. You know, uh, Lee was saying that he, he saw the, the commercial for David Spade last night. You know? <laughs> and I was telling Lee that, you know, listen, guys, I'm not the best fucking comic out there. But the last six weeks on the road, I've learned a lot about myself. You know, Fort Lauderdale and Boston and New Jersey and the people that came to Grand Rapids. You know, guys, uh, I feel like I'm on to something now, stand-up-wise especially. I paid my dues. And, you know, I was telling Lee, as a Jew, as a badass business Jew, as a businessman, there's not one Jew at Comedy Central that looks at the other and goes, come here for a second. That Diaz guy, I really don't like him. He's a fucking fat slob or whatever the fuck they want to say. But... This motherfucker's on to something. Why don't we give him a little something, just in case. Let him, let him do a special. If it goes well, it goes well. If it doesn't, we write it off and say he's a bum. But at least we have him in our fucking catalog. You know what I'm saying? That's business. Sometimes you let your feelings get ahead of what you really are. And I appreciate it that they don't want to do it. But David Spade, like I've said a thousand times, love the guy, love his TV shows, but he hasn't said nothing that somebody hasn't written from funny in fucking 30 fucking years. And I'm not lying here to nobody. I'm not player hating or whatever. There's a lot of people who ain't fucking funny on TV. 
Anyway, what the fuck are we going today with this shit, Lee? I don't know. <clears throat> How come you're not fucking controlling the podcast? <laughs> What's up, baby? What'd you do all week in Kutsaka? Looked at apartments. I had the most... I called you, and I wish you were there. Like, th- thank you for making me walk. Just, if I never... If I died tomorrow, that I was the happiest I ever was on Saturday. So where'd you go? Okay, so I, was, I went to go look at an apartment, and I had time in between another one, so I went and got some lunch. And I decided to walk to the next apartment. It was like half a mile away. Uh, <clears throat> so I was walking. And there were like a lot of homeless people. And I figured out why. It's because the grocery store nearby had a can delivery place. So they all they all hang out there. This woman was walking towards me. She looked me straight in the face. She said, did I see you yesterday? I said, no. She said, do you walk on La Brea? And that's in Hollywood. And I live in the valley. She said, I'm like, no. She's like, let me ask you something. I hear Warner Brothers is paying people to walk around and pretend they're Jewish. I th- What do you think about that? I'm like, no. She's like, I think that's true. I hear they don't really do anything. That they pretend they're Jewish. I said, maybe. And I walked away laughing for about 15 minutes. She did not know you were the flying Jew. She didn't know anything. You know nothing. You, you just fucking... And, and, the, and the funniest thing is most people get to... Not, not with this because my name's a flying Jew. But in life, people usually like are surprised when I say I'm Jewish. I don't know why. I, that apparently, I don't, I don't look like a Jew. I don't know what any either way, anyway. You got a nice nose. But just the fact that she said, "I hear Warner Brothers is paying people to p- pretend they're Jewish," it made me laugh for about fifteen. It minutes. never ends. It never ends. No. It, I told you that I attract the funniest people. Sometimes <laughs> when you're ringed up in this world, it, life gives you material. And if you said that on stage, yeah. because of the conversations we have here, nobody would believe you. Really? Nobody, yeah, because come on, uh, he calls you the flying Jew, and some homeless lady comes up to you <laughs> and says, "Are they paying people to act like Jews in Hollywood?" Think about that. That's hysterical. Now you're yeah. starting to live the life <laughs> of a comedian, where you see life. You know, it just throws fucking apples at you sometimes. Like something happens that's hysterical. Oh God! And you're like, I'm here by myself. Like the time I was in Florida a couple of weeks ago, and the guy yelled at the <laughs> fucking. And all of a sudden, the Hindu came out of the back, and there ain't no fucking Americans working here. And all of a sudden, he looks, and the Hindu comes out of the back. <laughs> you can't write that shit. Yeah. But when you're a comic and you have that mind, sometimes the universe throws certain things at you. I have had things happen to me when I'm alone. That that's when I wish I had the bloggy, but the bloggy wouldn't have caught it, right? Because I wasn't thinking that way. It's like when uh, people show you videos of a. Uh, the other day, John Rollo showed me a video of a fucking leopard attacking an alligator. Have Jesus. you seen that shit? Probably grabs him by the back. The leopard swims real low, and he comes out. You say to yourself, "Who had the camera?" Yeah. Who had the fucking camera there? Like that's brilliant. Like that's the first thing I think about. Was that guy standing there? Did he leave it there overnight? You know, I mean, what what the we're fuck? gonna have to get you? I don't know. I don't think it has this capability, but you know, have you heard of those Google glasses that they came out with? Yeah, we have to get you those. That's it, what I want to do. Be, Walk just, around with glasses and see what the fuck. Just I'm be not recording looking. all the time. It's amazing, and I talk about this constantly, people, and I love you guys. And part of this podcast is supposed to be really fucking funny. I'm a comedian, but it turns into different things. And I see shit when I'm out that amazes the fuck out of me. You know what the iPhone is made for? To detract us. Mm-hmm. It is amazing that people get shot in public places, airports, and I see people never paying attention to Well, life. it's the worst at the airport. I, people, you're not paying attention to life, man. You're in that thing too fucking much. When I sit down at a dinner table or something, after I look around, after I got my seat facing the fucking door because I'm watching everything that's going on, then I bring that fucking phone out. But until that time, I, I can't tolerate people looking at that fucking phone when life is going on around them, man. That's why I don't put all that shit on my fucking phone. Because I don't want to look at that right now. I'll look at it later. It's got nothing to do with me right now. If somebody knocked on, you know, it, it's the weirdest fucking thing what the phone does to people. And with all the bad shit that happens, how people do not pay fucking attention to life is beyond me. Well, you should see people in like cities where people actually have to walk. People are walking in the signs and stuff because they walk. They walk with it down. Did you see the video? I think it was in Chicago of the people on the bus and some guy took out a gun and no one noticed. This is what I'm talking about. <laughs> he just got off the bus because no one noticed anything. He was all pissed off. He's like, "Freeze!" And everybody's like, "Fuck!" It. <laughs> yeah. And he just said, "Fuck it." Nobody's paying attention. Drop me off. Nobody's, yeah. It's it's it's. I see it at the park when I take my daughter. Oh, okay. When I take my daughter to the park, I really fucking see 
how people act like they're on the phones. You're kidding. All that. Listen, man, when it comes to a kid, it's a split second. What do people always say? I took my eye off him for one minute. Well, that one fucking minute. There's times I turn around, I look back, and she's on top of the fucking ottoman, man. Oh, God. She's halfway standing there, and her foot is an inch away from the end. And I'm looking at this going down. She's just happy she's balancing herself. She takes one step, she's going down head fucking first. Yeah. I see it on the seesaw. She gets on the seesaw sometimes. But I see it with parents. And you know what? I can see when you're single and you're walking around, you're looking at that fucking retarded phone. When you got a fucking kid and shit and you've got to pay attention, you have to pay attention, man, to life. I'm telling you right now. It's the weirdest thing. The other day I was on uh, Koufax making a left to go to the coffee shop from fucking Chandler. Okay. And you know you wait there all fucking day for a green light to that left. Yeah. That's you. That's the right of way. Well, as I'm shooting, some chick, I swear to God, cuts in front of me. And I look at her. I pull the fucking car next to her and I look at her and she's on the thing. Like driving, hitting the bottom, hit the sidewalk. And I beep. And she looks up and I go, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> you know what she does? She gives me the finger and drives away. Because God forbid, she said, I'm sorry. Yeah. God forbid that miserable cunt took the time. She was so indulged in whatever the fuck was that twit with her fucking ra ra Range Rover. Yeah. And that fucking miserable fucking cunt. Could, and I'm sorry about the language, but it's Monday morning. We got to drop it. You know what I'm saying? Fuck it. Nothing good happens unless you tell the truth on fucking Monday. This dummy fucking, uh, you know, was looking at the text. And she yeah. looked at me. And she, you know. And then she doesn't claim responsibility. I didn't even accept it. Not even to say I'm fucking sorry. Right. You know, it's it just the end of this shit. It's killing me, though. Well, I read an article that was terrible. I don't I don't remember the city it was in. But two years ago, these, six, these three 16-year-old kids were riding their bike and this this mom was driving in a minivan and, and hit the kids that were driving, hit the kids biking. One of them died. One of them ended up in the hospital. And two years later, the mom is suing the kid's family who died because the fact that she killed him is causing her mental things. And she's saying he, he, they weren't biking uh, like to, uh, for the rules of the road. <clears throat> and like the kid's family is like freaking out. Like they're like, how can you how can you do this to us two years later? People are, I mean, and then like last week or something, there's this big article that this this uh, g this little teenage girl hit someone biking and said, "Oh, I don't really care." I was just one of those rich girls, and people are it's, driving is fucking scary now. Dude, I don't fuck around when it comes to driving. It petrifies the fuck out of me. Mm -hmm. I drive on the offensive with my foot on that fucking gas, <laughs> which means if you fuck around with me, I'll clock your fucking car. I don't give a fuck about Geico or the insurance companies. I drive on the fucking offensive, man. And on the defensive, but on the offensive. I drive on the offensive, defensive. That's a new fucking defense I put together there. Well, yeah. I mean, you have to. What are you looking at, cocksucker? I don't know. You have to do what? You have to drive on the offensive defense. That's right. That's what right. I was saying. Look at you. You bump into that guy's car ten times a fucking day. I will murder. How the fuck do you hit this poor nigga? I've never car? touched an asshole's car. And you know what the worst thing is? I'm pretty sure he's scraping the inside of my door now. Because I, I, I take pictures every day. And there's more marks now. So he's fucking, he's doing something. So this is, uh, the Jew's about to be on fire. He's retarded. We gotta flatten his one tire. Oh, no, trust me. I thought, I've thought about we it. We gotta fucking do something. So what's going on with Donald fucking Sterling? Oh. I mean, this is... <laughs> well, I mean, I, it, the funniest thing about this is everyone talking about this is, are, are white people. But, uh, so first of all, before I say anything, he's a, he's a terrible racist. <laughs> like, he's a bad, everyone, he's no, they've said it for years that he's just, like he he's had to pay uh, people off for doing this, like his old employees and the people who who live in his apartment buildings. Every everyone's known for years that he's a racist. This isn't like the first time, so he everyone knows he's a racist. He said he said some pretty offensive things about black people, but when you think about it, all old white people at their home by themselves are gonna say some pretty offensive things. This, if I were a millionaire or a billionaire, like an old man, I would listen to this and I would never date a twenty-year-old again, because this woman secretly recorded him. I don't know how many times. If you listen to the tape, she provoked him. She knew exactly what it'd be like if I came to you and said, "What do you think about these the Hindus working at Seven Eleven and recorded you?" I know what you're gonna say, and then she stole two million dollars from him. So, I mean, he said some pretty terrible things, but what do you... Everyone says terrible things at home. So, I mean, it's just... It's... You know, Lee, it's, I'm happy that you, you're 25 <laughs> and you think about this. 
Yeah. Something. Nothing kills me the most when people act surprised. Yeah. Like people are like, oh my God, I can't believe it's 2014 and somebody would think this way. I say a lot of crazy shit on this show. But everybody knows that, uh, you know, I wouldn't have anything if it wasn't for black people. When I came from Cuba, they were my best friends and they, they, they gave me the gift of friendship. I never fucking forgot that. And the posters on my wall are Richard Pryor and Julius Irving and, you know, Denzel Washington's my favorite act. I mean, you know, when you talk sometimes, you, you talk out of content, you talk to be funny, but everybody knows deep down inside. You know, uh, my, I go to acupuncture. I've been infatuated with the Chinese uh, uh, way of life since before because of my mother. Mm -hmm. My mother was a big Chinatown chick. She would go to Chinatown when I was a kid and buy different uh, herbs and drink them for different ailments, and I saw what it did to her. She used to have this thing, Pomada China. It's this little fucking yellow thing in a container. It smells weird. You put this on any elbow or muscle or a knee, and I believe in that shit. I'm just lazy to go down and do it. Uh, uh, my first girlfriend was fucking Chinese, Irish. There hasn't been a woman that's Irish. If you're Irish and you're a woman <laughs> and you got dirty feet, you better fucking be careful because I'm all over you. Jewish, who are my best friends? You and Ari fucking Shafia. So do you understand me, people? Uh, I've always, where well, I'm from in North Bergen, New Jersey, it's a beautiful place. You guys hear me say beautiful things about North Bergen. But they're racist motherfuckers. And I've always told other Spanish people I lived there, or Cuban kids, I've said, listen, man, this is North Bergen. It's great. But always remember, at the end of the day, you're always a fucking speck. And as long as you know that going in, it makes your life a lot easier. Mm -hmm. You know, if the guy's known to being racist, whatever, I don't know what happened. I just read that she had Instagram pictures. Well, I mean, now, how racist could he be? She's black and he's banging her. Well, She's yeah. black and Mexican. He's eating that fucking ass. She's sucking that dick. You know... <clears throat> One thing I don't, this chick, one thing that you bump into, the other day I went to the airport mm -hmm. when I flew out of here, and there was a woman that was a 12, but I wouldn't want to be five feet from her, and the guy she was with was a fucking loser too, he was a fucking pussy too, and this chick was one of these slash Asian black chicks that was tremendously hot, fake tits, tremendous rack, tremendous ass, but she even tried to get attention at the airport at six in the fucking morning, like that's what she was doing, she was right. talking loud and... You know, on my first class tickets by the window, you know, so everybody could fucking hear. And it was just embarrassing for this chick. And you could see that she was desperate and she had no fucking talent. See, the, this chick, the, this Kim Kardashian, see, 20 years ago it was okay if you are a woman and you had no fucking talent in this fucking town because people would do this. But now, you know, you had nothing. I'm sorry, I'm saying it the wrong fucking way. Now, because of Kim Kardashian, and I'm not mad at it. I don't give a fuck about it. It makes no difference to me. You got these chicks parading around, and they always find some old man to give them two or $3,000, and these chicks walk around like they're doing something special in their life. Yeah. But meanwhile, they're sucking. At the end of the day, they're sucking some old dick. Selling your soul. Yeah, have you seen pictures of this guy? This yeah, guy? this guy looks like Mickey Rourke that the operation just went bad. So here's this chick. I looked at the Instagram, and she's a pig. You know, she's out there doing whatever. And he told her, you could fuck black guys. Didn't he say anything to him? Yeah. You could suck that black yuck, yuck stick, whatever the fuck you want. You could do whatever the fuck you want. Just don't bring him to my fucking uh, thing. If you go to a Clipper game, it's all black people. Yeah. So what the fuck? You know, it's like... Now everybody knows the guy is a race. You just said it yourself. He's paid out before. Like apparently, like he's like uh, I, forget, I forget the guy's name, but a player a couple years ago said like he like he like he, it was his player on the court, the, his highest paid player. And he's saying like he's calling him the N word and calling him stupid, and he's a fucking. It's it's like the uh, that fucking cook a few months ago, Paula Dean, who 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 wanted to have slaves at her brother's wedding. You know what? It's 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 a terrible thing, and and you, you hope racism isn't there. And I think with each generation, we're getting a little bit less racist. But maybe but it's always there. But I don't give a fuck. Even... Listen, it's always there. It's and you have to yeah. assume it's fucking there. And I'm not gonna sit here and play the racist stick that I have no opportunities. You make your own opportunities in this life. You'll never hear me say that I didn't get this and that because I'm cute. That bullshit. I've gone after it like a fucking Jew in heat. You understand me? And if you're not going after it like that, then you, then those are the people that throw racist. Oh my God, I'm racist. They don't hire racist people. Keep that fucking. If you're the best at what you do and you go in there balls out, they don't give a fuck what color. If I know you can, if a corporation knows you can make them eighty fucking million dollars, how he knows, you don't give a fuck what color they are. The only color he is concerned about is fucking green. Yeah. There's a difference between being racist. I can't be racist. I could talk shit, 
because I'm trying to be funny. I'm a fucking moron. Mm -hmm. But I can never in my heart be racist. I can never, never, never in my heart because I know what these races have done for me. When I got out of the fucking prison, who tutored me? Who tutored me and gave me an, an education on economics that I never knew about? Mohammed Zabib. <laughs> Mohammed Zabib was his name. Mohammed Zabib with sandals on. I used to laugh with this guy. This guy used to break bread with me at my house. I used to break bread with him at his house. I never ate hummus. You know, it wasn't popular then. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't cool for a fucking Arab guy to bust out hummus. People say, put that away. It smells. <laughs> but do you understand me? So all the shit I talk is bullshit. But you know what's coming, you know, in my heart is there's people that just genuinely don't give a fuck. And most people are those people. I'll tell you what I didn't like, though. Like, I looked at Snoop Dogg's thing. And Snoop Dogg was like, hey, to the president of the Lakers or, the, or whatever, Clipper, yeah. fuck you, you chicken-eating motherfucker. Then you fight racism with racism. Because I know when 10 black guys are together, they say, look at that fucking yeah. uh, pencil neck, whatever they call it, <laughs> chicken neck, whatever, yeah. that white motherfucker. And I don't get mad at that. I don't get that. That's, hey, dog, that's what, this, this, that's what the media wants. That's what they want. They want that little anger in you. That 20% anger. They want you to walk around. They're always trying to create this fucking thing. You don't hear about the, 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 the doctor who saved the blind kid, but you always hear about the cop who, who said the racist statement in Oklahoma. They always come up with the fucking video of him hitting the fucking black guy. You know, they want that tension there. I don't want that tension there in my life. And some, the other day, I pulled up to a black guy, and I saw he had a Cadillac. And I pulled up next to him, and I said something like, Yo, what's happening, baby boy? And he looked at me like, well, it's another planet. But then I said, how's the Cadillac run? How is the, it's a new top 2014. And we started talking. You know, you always notice that when you're around black people, you sound a little blacker. Oh, yeah. You know, like a yeah. lot of people do. Hey, brother, you always throw like a slang or something at him. You know what? And when I left there, I was like, what the fuck is wrong with me? But he knew what my heart was. Yeah. And that's the most important thing. When I watched 12 Years a Slave a couple of weeks ago, and I played the first 45 minutes. I kept asking myself, why the fuck am I watching this? Oh, is it bad? I was well, this it. isn't what I believe in. This is not my belief. This is not even my fucking world. I couldn't exist in those worlds, in right. those times. I couldn't exist. That was not, that, those centuries were not made for me. I couldn't do that to another human being. But that's just fucking me. Yeah. You know, and then I, I watch it and I remember it's a movie and it's a story and I try to digest it. You know, when I watched uh, Amistad and they were throwing the black people off the fucking shit, you know, they were doing the same thing to Cubans in 79 who weren't paying. They were taking Cubans and going, you, you, you know, we called Lee Syatt. He says he's going to pay you 20 grand, but we call them back one additional 20 grand. And you go, fuck it. They throw you off the fucking boat. Jesus. Andy Garcia is trying to develop that story now about what happens when a country opens up, that, 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 that it's beautiful. You read about all the great stories about the guy who came without his children and opened up a restaurant and he became a millionaire and went back and got his kids. But you don't hear about all the people that got thrown off the fucking boats. Okay. You know, from all over this fucking world. What do you think? The Cubans were the only ones? Blacks got thrown off fucking boats out there. Listen, man, every race fucking suffered. And yeah. uh, when you make a statement like that, I've said it a thousand times, it's where your fucking heart is. Last weekend on the podcast, I said chink and nigger on one fucking podcast. I didn't feel bad about it at all because I knew what my heart was. The biggest fan in the world, my main man, Chung, up there in fucking Baltimore, <laughs> showed up the other night. He knows what my heart is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I love Chinese people. I love Korean people. I couldn't have that hatred in my heart, even if I fucking tried. But... It bothers me that people don't know the animal they're doing business with. You got to know the animal you're doing business with because then this will happen. Always keep that in mind. This motherfucker thinks I'm a nigger anywhere at the fucking end of the day. I know when people think I'm a criminal at the end of the day. What's the difference in prejudice? I'm a felon. You don't think there's people in the comedy business or in real life that, you know, he, he, he went to prison at one time. That's another word for me being fucking black. Felon and black is the same fucking word. Mm -hmm. So that that was the only interesting part to me is because they're saying that the Clippers, the players, and the coach should have the right to be a free agent at the end of the season. What would you do if, let's say, the owner of a comedy club chain—I don't want to say any of them—came out and had a tape like this and said, "I hate Cuban people." Would you work at that comedy club? I don't know. I don't know because. I know what this is. You think these comedy clubs hire me because they like Joey Diaz? They hire me because the church is selling tickets and people come to see me. Exactly. I've been around for 20 years. I know what time it is with them and they know what time it is with me. If, Like I told, uh, I was in uh, Grand Rapids and I was telling the other comedians, I, mean, I get off stage 
You think I'm the type of guy that goes up to the comics and say, when I said that joke, did you see the emotion? I don't give a fuck. You think my material is any good? I'm just telling you what's in my life. It's not brilliant fucking material. And there's another comic that actually works harder and, and sits down and writes a fucking joke for you or whatever. I try to do that, but I can't. But what I'm talking about is from my heart and the people feel it's fucking real. Uh, what, what's my point, Lisa? Yeah. I don't know. My point is that fucking, uh, you know, I'm not the best comic out there, but people know where my heart is. When people come to see me and I do the cocaine with the cat joke, they're like, he really gave his cat coke. Yeah, I was fucked up. I gave him a little fucking blast. Did I torture? No, I love the fucking cat. I suffer still to today. I think about Finney. You know, this morning I woke up. And when I wake up on Monday, when I wake up every fucking day, the only one who's up in the house are the cats. Yeah. And it's, uh, I was telling you the other night that uh, I have a little Siamese, two girls, Lee, uh, Wee Wee, Evie, and Lulu. You yeah. Know, and, uh, it's it's amazing how sweet they are. They're super bad sisters, and they lost a brother, uh, Demi Junior DJ. They lost him; he died, right? But super bad lived, and the two girls lived. And I have other cats, and I've never had three sweeter cats in all my life. I don't know what the, those cats have been mine since day one. I've had them in the yard as they were little kittens. They play with me. I seen Lulu stand up to her father. I'm like, he's gonna kill you. Lulu one day did that cat thing where the, she got really skinny and hissed at him. He was a little, she was a little fucking shit. I loved those cats. I saw those cats grow up. I remember going on vacation to Tennessee with my wife for three days and missing those cats and worrying about the cats. Calling home, G was my friend then upstairs, uh, an African kid, and his wife, she was, <laughs> she was Japanese. And I paid him money to feed those kittens. I was so worried about them those three days because in the mornings, I'd be out. I'd get in the shower and run downstairs and say, DJ, and DJ would come running out and he'd play with a ball with me and then Superbad wouldn't talk to me, but the two girls would come close and that little chubby thing, Evie, that is my life. And when I wake up on Monday mornings, when I wake up any morning, I've got to tell you, man, I go to each of them and I pet them and I give them a hug as the coffee's getting ready, I feed them and I pick up, I tell my wife, I go, I got 10 minutes of cleanup. Who, who ripped this down off the couch? Who, <laughs> who spit up a fucking hairball? Who fucking, uh, you know, ripped the paper in half? Who knocked the garbage down? Like if you eat shrimp and you put the shells in the garbage. Every morning I wake up to five minutes. But no matter how angry I am sometimes at them, like I don't get angry, but I'm like, what the fuck? You know, I wake <laughs> up to this shit. I pick them all up in the mornings. Like this morning I picked up fucking Fidel and I picked one up so hard. He's like, I hear him go, eh. And I squeeze him and I kiss him and I tell him I love him. And I pick up Lulu, and I picked up Evie, and I said, like, and Evie, you got to watch, because when you put her down, when you walk away from her, she swats at you, <laughs> because she gets mad that you're leaving, so you got to walk backwards on that bitch. And it's funny, because those are the only two, like, I came over, and you saw, I mean, I, I'm cool with most of your cats now, Evie and Lulu are, like, the only two that, like, don't really mess with me. No, they don't mess with nobody. Lulu and Evie don't mess with nobody, they just, they're like her father, they're tough. You know, this morning, I, as I was feeding them, I looked up, and Lulu had Harry by the fucking neck. <laughs> she just biting him by the fucking neck. And he's like, what, you, what am I doing? And then I broke him. I'm, Lulu, stop it. And when Harry went away, I pet her. You're a good fucking girl. That's a way to control that motherfucker. <laughs> but that hugging those cats, man, I can't be racist. It puts me in the best mood in the fucking world. When I leave that house, you know, at 5.30, and after I hugged them all, like, as I was leaving, Demi jumped on top of my backpack. Really? Because he wanted love. He was sleeping when I was giving out love. <laughs> and I went to pet him. He dropped. Like, for me, to oh, pet my stomach. So I pet him. I got down. I kissed him. I told him I loved him. And it's, uh, I, when I do that in the mornings, man, my day fucking changes. Like, I, no matter what, I wake up with what bad thought is in my mind, what I went through over the weekend, what I'm thinking about, you know, as soon as I do that in the mornings, so. Yeah. Listen, man, to the coach, Don Sterling, I don't know what the fuck is in your heart and, and in your head and what you said, but you got to stay away from those scandalous fucking bitches. Those women are the worst. I mean, think of a woman who sells her soul. Look, I pee every day, and I look at my dick. It's the ugliest fucking thing. Sometimes, you know, when you pee when you're 25 and you pee when you're 50, it's different pee. I peed the other day somebody farted in the fucking room. You understand me? The stink that comes out of your pee hole is fucking amazing when you're 50. Your piss smells really? horrendous. Oh my, oh my God. When I was a little kid, I used to have to clean my mother's, uh, the bathroom at the bar. Okay. The men's bathroom. And I would go in there and the pee smelled so fucking bad. It smelled so fucking bad. As a young kid, I'd go in there and go, what the fuck? My pee don't smell like that. Well, guess what? Now it smells like that. Sometimes when it comes out yellow, it's like a fart coming out of your dick hole. Oh God. And that girl sucks that old dick. Yeah. I'm 51. 
I can't imagine what my disgusting dick and my balls smell like. Well, he's just a terrible... Like his, He's still married so to his a, wife. His yes. wife went to the game yesterday. Yeah, so if he's a terrible person, think about it. Yeah. This guy is just a ball of fucking bad karma yeah. with his money. But it's so funny that this chick, she sold her soul years ago. She yeah. sold her soul. I looked at her Instagram pictures of her and her Range Rover and her cars and her life is banging. And she probably pulls up at these places and she had a professional photographer take these pictures of her with a bear on and all this shit. Well, she no, probably she, wanted to be an actress. Did you right, hear her? Did, right, did you no, listen no. to the tape at all? No. It's I like, don't. she was like, oh, but we love each other and I'm black, I'm mixed and what's, I can't, I, I can't live in this world that it still has racism in it. It's, it's, so, it's such overacting. But I mean, it's, she doesn't it, even know what she's saying. Oh, she's God. just still regurgling on the fucking, uh, on the fucking whatever that's in the sperm that she drank that morning. Yeah. She's still gurgling on the, uh, well, there's a gluten-free fucking sperm. I These people don't know what the fuck they're talking about. Yeah, his, he's 75 fucking years old. That shit's gluten-free. <laughs> he's got that old man sperm. They don't knock your fucking wig off. What the fuck, Lee? Why are we talking about this shit? Who gives a know. shit? Where's my man Tony Bennett this morning? It's Monday morning. It's a beautiful day to be alive. Brush your teeth, comb your hair, smile in front of the mirror. Let these motherfuckers know you're dangerous. I want to be around to pick up the pieces when somebody breaks. Yo, huh? What's up, Lisa? Yeah, you bad motherfucker. No edibles today. I'm taking care of you. Oh, okay. Because Wednesday, I'm making your fucking hair grow in front of me. Well, I don't want to hear those live podcast, right? Live, early morning. We're going for broke. It's the last day of the month. I'm giving you two days. The vitamin C yourself, go for a walk and get your energy up. I'll do whatever. I'm tying this, this table to your moving. fucking back on fucking Wednesday, cocksucker. As you used to do with me. It's going to be very interesting, though. I think they're going to make him sell the team. Just as it started getting good. He's going to lose hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, you know what, man? The fix is in. They were in the playoffs. She just He just destroyed the whole playoffs. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, that girl just destroyed the whole playoffs. They're broken. They're walking around. And they're young, so they can't believe what happened. But they should have known. You know, you, you, there's some people who know where they stand in life, and there's some people who don't know where they stand in life. Or they know where they stand in life. They just don't want to believe it. They just don't want to believe it, Lee. And it's, a, and it's a big shocker when it happens. It shouldn't shock you, man. Yeah. You know, you said something interesting. If a comedy club owner was to say, listen, man. I know comedy club owners that hate fucking black people more than fucking Don Sterling, but they do black shows there. And you know what? The owners leave on those nights. They're not there. They don't give a fuck, you know, and, and, and they, they make money. They make cash register of all the black people. Cash registered with those soul nights and uh, Freedom Mondays and all that fucking shit, you know, and they don't give a fuck. You got to assume these motherfuckers. There's some people who actually care for the human race. And they fucking, yesterday I went to, to, to church, you know, mm -hmm. with my little fucking girl. And uh, and at the end of church, I went, you know, you put them in daycare. My wife goes upstairs and I sit in daycare and watch them a little while. <laughs> and there was the cutest little black girl in there. I just want to go over and hug her. And listen, man, it's not racism. But even at that age, they know this kid's different. Yeah. There were six white kids in the room and one black girl. She was innocent. She didn't know. She doesn't know. But sometimes racism comes in the form of ignorance. It always is. It's just ignorance. You know, I would be ignorant if Jasper Williams didn't take my hand those days in Harlem. I would be very ignorant if Jasper Williams never walked me up to his fucking building and ate with me. Like, I don't know, their family had no fucking money. My family had money. I remember going up there and taking out like a $10 bill when I was five. And they're all looking at me like, where the fuck did you get a $10 bill from? And I'd give him money and go buy sodas because that's what my mother taught me as a young man. When you go to somebody's house, even at fucking five, I knew that you went down and got the $10 worth of soda. And bring, I remember bringing Pepsi up to their house and thinking black people like Pepsi. You know, I like <laughs> fucking Coke. But on Saturday nights, they would open their couches for me. We would dance. And they never looked at me as being a spick or as being a fucking uh, honky or whatever. They were opening their culture to me. And I never forgot that lady. I never Ever forgot that man? Never. I could think of all my little black friends growing up in Catholic school, as a read over law, and just all these little black kids that I, 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 I don't know. I gave them extra love and attention. You know, I always liked the underdog. I believe in the underdog because I'm a fucking underdog. You know, but I think of those times, man, with that black family and what they did for me and what 
how I can never think that way. And I can never think that way about, and I talk a lot of shit. Dog, I talk a lot of shit. I'm the first one to tell you, I, I talk shit just for the laugh sometimes because the word Hindu is funny. You know, when we said the word Hindu is fucking funny. Yeah. But man, you know, there's a kid who came, I met at the fucking uh, weed store. I have Hindu friends, man. I don't give a fuck what they are at the end of the day. You know that. Meanwhile, if you're my brother, we're brothers at the end. Yeah. At the end, you, you need a gun. Let's go get a gun and shoot these motherfuckers together because I know I get the same from you. You right. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, we got somebody. Yeah. What's up, cocksucker? Yo, hey. what's up, little brother? Dion. It's me. What's happening? Hey, Joe, what's up? Why do you call me Joe after 30 fucking years? I told you about this already. It's either Coco or Diaz. Yeah, I know you don't like Coco. Oh, no, I like Coco. I don't no, like Joe. I don't no, like that no, Joe shit. I don't like when people from old school, people that I ate chicken cutlets no, at their no, house no. and fed me, I don't like when they call me fucking Joe. You all right? You people knew no, me as Joe, Coco. What did your father used to call me? Coco Loco, right? Yeah, Henry Rogers. Roger. What's up, baby? Nothing much, man. I'm just... Working like a fucking dog. I I would thought you don't say working like the slave. Don't say that today, please. I got enough uh, fucking problems with uh with uh what's his name? The coach of the fucking the owner of the fucking LA Clippers. What's up, Timmy? You know I love you. We talk once a week. We've been friends for a long time. And it's funny, Timmy always calls me and says, Hey man, you know, I listened to the podcast and when you were talking about being a kid on this block, I remember that or what happened to that guy and it really inspires me, Timmy. It really uh, does something to me. When one of the kids I grew up with, first of all, I still talk to you. You know, I was very tight with your brother, but I still talk to you a lot. And uh, that you like the show. You like what we're doing and the stories move you, you know? Yeah, um, you know, I've been driving a truck for, what is it, since 84, 85, so what is that, almost like 30 years. And I've always been a big fan of talk radio, Stern, O and A, and now with the podcast, you know, I got tons of on my phone. But you know, the regulars I listen to is you, Rogan, and uh, Jim Florentine. I like, but uh, listening to your show, I it's weird because you bring up names from the past and people I haven't thought of in so long, and just like kind of forgot about that they they were even in my life. Well, I even met them. Like, Ruby Jerez, you talked about him before. I forgot about that guy. And then when I start thinking about him, I think about him. He's hanging out with the kid Rabbit. He looks like the guitarist from uh, Cheap Jack. Yeah. Remember that kid? He had the long blonde hair. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. see him. He's, he's still around the third. So, you know, it's it's uh, it's weird. And, and for me to call in and be on the show, it's really weird because I never wanted to call into like a talk show or anything like that. I mean, I listened to, like I said, 30 years to the talk radio and I never wanted to be a caller. So for me to call in and talk and hear myself on the radio, it's, it's fucking crazy. You know, and, and to see you, you know, acting in movies with De Niro, and, you know, and the guys you've acted with, it's it fucking blows me away. I'm sorry. It blows me away because... These are guys growing up, you know, you see, De Niro was in Godfather 2, man, that movie's so great. And for you to be in his presence, I know he's just a regular guy who puts his pants on one leg. I know all that stuff, but still, it's De Niro, man. You know, and, and for you to have that success and stuff like that, and you made it, you know, we never would have thought that stuff when we were younger. We, it was crazy. It was just constantly just getting high, drugs, and laughing, and, you know, all that nonsense we did when we were kids. It's, uh, Timmy, it's, I still remember going to see 48 Hours with your brother. You know, I remember seeing Nick Nolte one day at a store and just thinking about your brother, Fernie, and Glenn Conti in the dead of the winter going to see that movie and laughing our fucking asses off. You know, that, that's what it, it crazy to me that I went to see these guys with you guys. You know, I went to the yeah, movies with yeah. you guys and now I'm standing next to these guys. It, it's fucking crazy. And for me, I just laugh. Timmy, I laugh because if they only knew, if they only, if people only fucking really knew, like there's people that listen to this podcast and still probably go, you know, what the fuck, Joey? We like you. You don't, they don't know, Timmy. They don't know that, you know, I used to snort coke under that rocket ship on 88th Street Field and 
you know, that little rocket ship. I remember doing an eight ball and my nose was bleeding and crying because I didn't know when my life was going to change, you know. And and it's amazing, Tim. Yeah. And I'm not a, I'm not a millionaire. I'm not financially, none of that shit. But you know that I'm rich in life. Like, what happened here is a fucking once in a lifetime, especially the guys like us, man. It's, it's, yeah, um, it's, if you, I, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I just thinking those Sunday dinners at your house with your grandmother. If I would have popped my head up at one of those Sunday dinners and looked at all of you and go, hey, not for nothing, I'm happy you Irish and German motherfuckers <laughs> fed me. But in 30 years, I'm going to do a movie with De Niro. Your grandmother would have thrown a fucking can at me, dog. She would have thrown shit at you. She would have thrown shit at me. So to That's us, funny. Timmy, this is fucking out of this world, yeah, Timmy. Right. This is something that uh, yeah. is unbelievable. I remember the time when the, the, the water broke in Jersey City and I took your brother down to the shore and he got burnt to death with the suntan, remember? And we took him yeah, back yeah. and your grandmother was in the living room and your brother was fucking purple from the sun he was purple they kept putting that yellow ointment on him that <laughs> what's that pink <laughs> shit what's that pink shit Timmy uh, oh my god I don't, the, I don't know you know calamine calamine about. lotion right they kept putting yeah, calamine yeah. lotion so your grandmother I get down there and I'm like what's up Roger you coming I ain't going nowhere look what you motherfuckers did to me yesterday I'm all red <laughs> and the whole time he's yelling at us your grandmother is at the dinner table drinking a beer going like this. Put Noxima on it. <laughs> she kept saying, put Noxima on it. And your brother kept saying it and looking at your grandmother and then he kept looking back like, Coco, how am I going to go out tonight? And your grandmother kept saying, put Noxima on it. And he looked and he goes, Grandma, say Noxima one more fucking time. I dare you. <laughs> and your father's like, Roger, relax. She keeps saying fucking Noxima. Put the Noxima on it. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it was crazy. Yeah, my brother was a whole different, we had, my brother's so much different now. He's not the same person he was back then. And, uh, you know. Timmy, he couldn't be. Takes, Timmy, he couldn't be. Soul, man. We've had this conversation about your brother before. He could not be. We could not continue to do him, Glenn Conti, and Fernie live in this other world now because... I'm the only one that could believe what happened. I think you know why? Because I put my mother in a casket at 15, and I believe that anything could fucking happen at any time in this life. Glenn Conti listens to Joel Osteen now. Can you believe that? My brother, Glenn Conti, who was in the car with us, who did blow and ran over hookers. You know, you got your brother. The last time I saw your brother, I said to him, hey, you still banging hookers? And he goes, no. Now I let them jerk me off with their feet. <laughs> Do you understand me? These are the guys. Fernie, I don't know what happened to him, but if people understood that year and a half, what us three did together, what us four did together, me, your brother, and those two guys. You know, Timmy, this morning when I was thinking of calling you, I was sitting there drinking coffee one day, and I had to tell you the truth. If somebody came to me today, some white guy with greasy hair and a suit and a fucking cross on, and he said to me, Coco, I got a deal for you. I'm going to give you one night. Fernie, Conti, and, and Roger. You're going to meet at 8 o'clock. I'm going to give you all the blow, the quaaludes, whatever the fuck you want. I'm going to give you a call. It's not going to get pulled over, but at the end of the night, you die. And you have to walk away from all this. I'd have to tell him to give me 24 hours because I'd have to think about it. That's how much I miss those guys and that camaraderie. Like, it, it was two years. And, you know, you got to remember, Timmy, my mother had just died. If it wasn't for your brother and those guys and your family with the Noxema stories and all that shit, I wouldn't be here, man. I would have been an insane they asylum. They really, they, they, I, that's where I remember my most memories with you were me, you, and guys sitting in Ronnie's basement, remember, behind a pile of laundry. <laughs> you have to climb, climb over Ricky's dirty underwear. Oh, my God. They had six feet of fucking laundry downstairs. <laughs> and your brother used to go, I would go downstairs, but I had a high hurdle over the fucking clothing. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's it, weird. It's not just, it's just, uh, do, you, do you look back on some of the stuff and, and, like, it's not real? Do you feel like some of it's not real, it didn't happen, and then you think, it's, it's, I remember it, it happened, but 
you get that weird feeling of like you didn't do. I don't know. I don't know if you feel the same way I do. No, everything that I did in North Bergen was real. I was so fucked up, drugged up, you know, and and years have gone by with all the drugs and everything, and you know, just being, uh, you know, I haven't had a drink since 2001, but uh, you know, I smoked a little weed here and there, and you know, I can't because of my job, but uh, you you just can't go back. You know what I mean? Growing up is tough. You know what I mean? To be a man and a father and all that stuff. Not easy. It's really not easy, man, to be out there with responsibilities and stuff like that. No, you no, know, no, no. It's not easy. To me, it's not. But, That's you know, it. we did it to the... We pushed... We pushed the drug hill to it. Listen, man, I have a baby girl. I have a 16-month-old baby girl. It's, it's over. It's over now. It's over, but listen to me. I had this opportunity once before, and I don't fucking remember it. I don't remember it, Timmy. I don't remember changing diapers. You know, me and that little girl don't talk today, and I don't blame her because I don't remember a lot of things because I put cocaine first. You know, and a lot of people do that in the beginning, then they try to get their life back. I got a second chance. Tim, Tim I'm the second chance guy, you know. I keep getting second <laughs> fucking chances in life, and I, you know, do the best I can with them. But I don't remember, you know. So I know that when you have a child, right now I quit smoking two months ago. I don't know why. I don't know. I didn't want it in the house no more. I was sick and tired of having it in my lungs. But at the other hand, I want to look her in the face sometimes. You know, I want to. I want it to be real. You know, and and hey, Tim, what my point was with your brother before and those guys in the car, is that I miss those times so much. It hurts. I miss those guys yeah. so much. It hurts, and it's thirty years later. I miss those guys. I've been talking to Fernie's brother online, but I still haven't busted the question yet, how your brother's doing, because I don't know how he's going to react. You know, Fernie put a lot of his blame of his life on me and us. So, yeah, yeah, he went down pretty hard. He yeah. disappeared for a while, and, and I said, I told you, I've seen him, I guess, it must have been uh, the early 90s. He was working in Leo's in Hoboken. And that restaurant, he was working as a, as a cook in the back there, and then... Uh, I don't know what happened to him after that. I haven't seen him. But, uh, yeah, Fernie was a good kid, man. He was quiet. You know, he, he was a really good kid. I, I, I know him since when I moved up to 64th Street and when I think that was the fourth or fifth grade. And you were probably, that's when you first moved into North Bergen. I moved to uh, North Bergen in 73, but I didn't go out in North Bergen until like 75 was when I went to McKinley. Yeah, I, I remember you from the basketball courts across the street from uh, Baldano's house. Yeah. I remember when I was a kid, seeing you down there, you know, with uh, Snow Bush and all them guys, you know, all them other guys, the Benders and all them guys. There was You guys were a couple blocks away from us. But, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's all, it's, it's, it blows me away to hear, you know, the things that you talk about because it brings it back so vividly, you know what I mean? And, and it's, it's, uh, Sometimes I just, I have to stop the truck and I, and I find myself, you know, like almost, you know, crying because I miss it too. But, you know, what I went through to get off drugs, it was, uh, it was, it was a living hell. I had to go down to Florida for months and detox all the pills with this hell. And, uh, you know, Roger was doing the same thing and we were in deep and, and, uh, you know, and still today, you know, I have really bad back pains from driving this truck all day. And, you know, I struggle, man. I struggle with it. And, uh, you know, it's to be clean and sober and clear minded is one of the greatest things in the world. But for a drug addicts like me and you, you know what I mean? We still savor the, the drug thing. Like, you know, like you said, you would want to go back with it half the time before. It, that's such an insane thought. Only a drug addict would think like that. You know what I mean? And that's, but that's the way I think, and that's the way I feel too. You know, so I, I, I would, if I wanted to go back, it, it would, I like, I always say to myself, like, start life again. I would still do drugs again, but I wouldn't get as bad. You know what I mean? Instead of saying to yourself, well, I'm never touch drugs again. I say yeah, I'd go back and start over, but I would just take it easy with the drugs, which is insane thought because I'm a drug addict. I'm, I'll never take it. Easy. You know what I mean? So that's just a, it, it's ingrained in me. It's the way we grew up. It's our generation, you know, this generation coming up. I don't know, my sons, who knows what's going to happen, Joe. I don't know. It's a crazy world out there. I really don't know, man. You know, it's crazy because uh, 
I stopped doing the coke and the pills, but the transfer of addiction, I went over to reefer. I felt that was the that was the where I was the safest was with reefer, you know. And when I say I would go back, I, I mean, I don't think I could ever do a line of coke again or a pill. Oh, I got ecstasy at the house. I got pills at the house. I look at them, you know, once a week and go, what, what, when am I going to give this away? Uh, just to sit with them, just to sit with them and drive for an hour and uh, talk about where our lives went and what happened. And, you know, it, it would be great to see them. You know, when I go home, I always think of calling Roger, but I know deep down inside, me and Roger are best friends from afar. You know what I'm saying? I know that yeah, Roger yeah, yeah, would yeah. be uncomfortable if I went and tried to smother his private life. I know that Roger would feel very uncomfortable. After three minutes, he'd have nowhere to go. He yeah, had, yeah, our yeah. conversation he, would he, have nowhere he, to go. Yeah, right. And he's my brother, and that's the way it is with us now. No, I know. Hey, listen, kind of, the most important thing. Kind of close. Yeah, the most important thing about life is knowing where you stand. If you don't know where you stand with your people and your friends, it's going to be a nightmare. And I love Roger to death, yeah. but I would never call Roger and say, hey, where's your address? I'm on my way, because he would have a nervous breakdown. Uh, yeah, yeah, this, yeah. This, yeah. yeah. Talk, to you, talk to you for 10 minutes, and then, like, all right, coach, I'll see you later. And he's been no, doing that not, since he was a kid. But now, at least 20 years ago, I'd go to eat with him. Remember when you could go to eat with him? It was always fun. He would torture people while he was eating and whatever. He wouldn't even do that now. I'd get him to loosen up. I could get him to yeah, loosen yeah. up, not to smoke pot, nothing like that, but I could get him to laugh and to crack a racist joke or something. He was always good for something. But it's uh, it's really weird that in this day and age, Timmy, I still call you, you call me, we, we laugh. You'll say, hey, you told that story the other day that was fucked up. Uh, you know, I forgot all about that. We grew up, and listen, man, I don't know what the fuck I am. I, I don't know. But I tell you one thing, we met a lot of interesting people growing up. I know I did. Yeah, yeah. And it, just in our fucking blocks. Just, just, you know, I still remember what, the most popular neighborhood for crazy people in our neighborhood was 64th Street Field. For a lot of people yeah. who know North Bergen or may not know North Bergen, there's like eight parks where kids used to hang out in. But the one that had the worst reputation was 64th Street Field. And every time you'd walk past it, you always had to be prepared. Like some kids are like, we're going to walk past it real quick and look straight. Don't look at them. Don't look at them. You know, but there was... The rock. The rocks. I still remember one night snorting coke at Randy Mergel's house until 5.30 in the morning and going, we got to go for a walk. Me, him, Agostino, And it, we had to be there at 7 in the morning at school. I used to go to school first period. I had CIE work study program. I'm a fucking junior and it's 5.30 in the morning. Again, for your people at home. I'm a junior in high school. It's 5.30 in the morning. We're snorting coke at somebody's house. The first class is at 7.30. This is why I'm fucked up. This is why this podcast is crazy. And I remember making a right on that corner by Lincoln School and walking down to the field and thinking I was just going to get air and seeing Corky and 20 other people on the rocks with their shirts on from going to work the day before. I thought I was doing something cool. But there was 20 other fucking people that were men that were already out still drinking from the night before that hadn't even gone home after fucking work. Yeah, that was... All them guys were... That was Corky, the Worthington brothers, my wife's family, Dowling, Billy Dowling, Tommy Dowling, all them guys. Um, yeah, they were the next level up from us. You know, Randy, me, you, Randy, and the Thomas, Davy Thomas, Joey Thomas. Davey yeah, Thomas, well, who taught me how to go fag bagging? <laughs> That's who went fag bagging first. He's the first guy to tie up some guy. He tied up the piano player from Lawrence Welk. He's the first guy ever to fucking cause damage on 64th Street Field. I mean, these kids were fucking crazy, but these kids, yeah, nobody yeah. was rich. Timmy Holloway, correct or no correct? Nobody was rich, bro. There was a couple oh, people no. that had money uptown, but besides that, everybody fought for themselves. And if anybody found out you had money, we'd try to take it. Like, you yeah, couldn't yeah, go out nobody, at night without you jack. We'd jack you for a 10, something. If we knew you had a 50 on you, we had to walk with a 10 with something. You know, I, I, I just, uh, I could write a book about the two years I spent with Roger and how many laughs I had and how many times, man, I wasn't sure about my life. But Roger made me laugh, and it made me forget about I remember the night that Glenn Conti beat that kid up and broke his jaw. And two nights later, I get a call from Roger. He's at... He's at, he's at uh, Greg, Gregory's seven-day weekend, and he's going crazy. This is when your brother was definitely the funniest man in America. He still is. 
This was right around the time you pulled up with the car and you left the lights on, the blinkers on. Yeah, yeah. And he came out and he goes, Timmy, what's the circus coming to town? Turn the fucking blinkers <laughs> up. I'll never forget that statement, but we were at Corky's. Yeah, yeah, he's, uh, yeah, I, I, it's weird. I don't, I, I can hardly remember that far back, man. From all, from all, from all the abuse to my brain, I, 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 I know what you're talking about, but I can hardly remember it because I know it happened and it, it's there, but... You, you know, can't close your eyes, Timmy, for, I, for I, one I second. Close your I fucking... I can't imagine him being that guy anymore. Oh, no, he's not he's that guy. Oh, no, no, no. And look at me. I'm not that guy anymore. I'm not the guy that used to call you and say, pick me up, we're going on a fucking ride, Timmy. Yeah, you'd you know, be naked in the back of my car. Oh, we wouldn't. I wouldn't I wouldn't do that to nobody <laughs> anymore. But it's so funny that uh, uh, Glenn Conti had just broken that kid's jaw. I don't remember what the kid's name was. And his jaw was wired up, and he was at Corky's waiting for Glenn Conti. There was a little bounty waiting for Glenn Conti. And your brother, the balls on your brother, he walked right into the storm at 8 o'clock. You know how people used to go out at 10 then? Not your brother. He went out at 8. He was going to get the jump on the night. And he would call me up, Coco Loco, where you at? I'm at, I'm at Corky's. Come on up. I just got a package. Come on up here. And I remember walking in, and the Johnny Vest was working. Do you remember the bartender, Johnny? Yeah, he always yeah, wore yeah. a vest. Yeah, exactly. So he called him Johnny Vest, right? And your brother at that time was a professional bartender killer. Okay? If there was a bartender, your job, your brother's job was to torture him till the guy quit. He did it to the guy at the Mai Kai. Remember he had that Chinese restaurant? He used to call the guy over and karate chop him. <laughs> he used to pay a Chinese guy to let him karate chop him. You'd walk into the Mai Kai and he'd go, watch this. Come here. The guy would walk over and the guy would put his neck down and Roger would go, ha! <laughs> you can't write that shit. You can't write that shit. Roger would give him like a 10. Here's a 10. Let me karate chop you one time. So we're at this fucking Gregory seven day weekend. That was the name of the bar. And I walk in and they're all looking at me because I'm Glenn Conti's friend. Glenn Conti broke this guy's jaw on a Monday night. It's Wednesday. Who goes out on a fucking Wednesday with an eight ball? I walk up and in those days, your brother used to smash the ashtrays at the bar. You remember those black plastic ashtrays? Timmy, yeah. he would bang them on the yeah. bar until they broke in half. And the guy would just keep breaking them and put new ash. Why would you put a new ashtray up there? And he'd, get, and he'd get carried away and pick up the ashtray and start banging. Johnny Vest, give me a double. Give this cocksucker a double, too. Give the Coco Loco, get over here. And then he'd yell, Coco's in the house. Put your wallets in your front pocket. You know, you'd always say that, remember? <laughs> he would always say that. Wallets in front pockets. Wallets in front pockets. <laughs> <laughs> Coco Loco. And all of a sudden, he started hitting the ashtrays. And, and the guy that had that broke, that uh, Glenn Conti had broken his jaw, was wired up sitting right next to Roger. And Roger is looking, but he's close to Roger, like he's listening to Roger's conversation. And Roger's looking at me, and he's fucking hitting the, the, the thing. He's like, Coco Loco's in the house. Coco Loco's in the house. And all of a sudden, he's like, how you doing, buddy? You know how he'd hit your ass? And he'd go, how you doing, buddy? And with one of those how you doing, buddies, he looks over at this guy, and the guy's looking at me. He goes, what do you want, a jawbreaker? And he looks right back at me. <laughs> he asked this motherfucker, what do you want, a jawbreaker? And he went right back to me like he hadn't said nothing. And I just had to keep it fucking together and laugh my ass off, man. But, Timmy, yeah, I'm happy man. that, uh, you know, you always call the show and you're still my friend. And you got me lost last time on the way to Artie Lang. But, you know, Timmy, after all these years, we're still yeah, fucking yeah, yeah. friends, brother. And uh, I love you to all my heart, and I love that you're still in my life, man. I really, I wouldn't know yeah, what yeah, to do yeah. if you weren't in my life. And we have friends we talk about. We talk about my man Guy Tabasco and, you know. But uh, we come from a, you know, Timmy, and I'll tell you why I miss that time. Because I don't have that no more. If I had that camaraderie right now, I'd be a different man out here. You know, if I had Darren Rago still alive, I'd be, I'd have a different man. I'd be a different man, you know. Well, he, he was, he was, uh, he was right across the street from me just before we died. And I, I seen him and he was, he was, uh, I, I don't know, I, he wasn't himself either. He was because he was married with a kid, and he didn't want to be there either. You know what I mean? But she was trying to she was trying to tame him. 
No, he, no, she was trying. Hey, bro, a woman's job is to tame us. It's just at what time yeah. they walk into our life. He I'm, couldn't tame it. He was like no, a he was no. destined for, for whatever. I, the way he went out, you know what I mean, is, is sad. But uh, he was destined for something bad to happen to him. Along. He was really wild, that kid. You know, and he was into stuff that none of us, well, I know you know more than I do, but, you know, I it's, he was into some crazy shit, man. You know, it's funny. I have a picture of him on my wall, and then I have a little thing that on Mondays, I, I, uh, every Monday, I put water out for the spirits, and I light a candle for him. In fact, on the way here, I think I lit the candle early. I don't want the house to burn down. And uh, I look at their pictures, and I look at all of them, Darren, Dominic Special, Anthony Balzano, my mother. You know, I look at my friend's daughter, Emma. I have all their pictures out there, and I, and I think about them, man. And those guys give me strength because they're not here. But I know they're watching over me, you know. I know that Darren watches over me, and I know that uh, Anthony Balzano, you know. I think about these guys. I keep these guys alive in my heart. And it makes me strong. It makes me stronger than fucking death to keep these guys alive. Because it's all I have, you know. Uh, I really, it's, it's so weird. I keep these memories alive because... It keeps me moving forward. It reminds me who the fuck I am. I never, ever wanted to forget who the fuck I was, man. N never. It gave me so much strength growing up with you guys. I never wanted to forget. So uh, thank you for calling me, and thank you for always digging the podcast and shit, brother. Yeah, it's a, it's a great... Like I said before, I, uh, I, I know radio because I've been listening for years. And like I said last week, when that lady, when you guys... You guys were uh, getting loud, and that lady knocked on the door. That was that, that was just that was great radio, man. I was laughing my uh, my ass off when that happened. And uh, it's a really it, it's a good show. He's a good producer, you know. And uh, fuck Lee, I love this. It <laughs> fuck this me, cocksucker. It keeps me it keeps me engaged. You know what I mean? It, 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 it there's something about it that I love listening. I don't know. If, I don't know if it's because I know all the stories and I know all the people, but it's. It is a good radio show, and uh, I hope you have continued success with it. Well, I love you, brother. And I, uh, you know, I'm happy that you still contact me, and we call each other, and we fuck around, and we giggle, and we, you know, I like when you call me after a podcast and go, "Hey, man, when you were talking about that the other day, I remembered that situation." Yeah. But uh, you're my buddy, and I'm happy that you called on a Monday, and uh, we'll talk soon, my friend. Give my best right, to your so family thanks. always. All right, man. I love you too, brother. I love you, Thank brother. You. Stay blacker than black. That's the real deal, brother. That's that's as real as it gets, cocksucker. <laughs> what the fuck are you looking at? What do you want, a jawbreaker? <laughs> what do you want, a jawbreaker? And then he went right back to me like nothing happened. And the guy's face just turned. And that was, you know, it was amazing that uh, you guys always send me emails and say, hey, man, you know, thank you. I was on Oxycontin. I was on heroin. I lost 200 pounds. You guys send me all these fucking emails. You want to thank me and Lee? I got to tell you something. I want to thank you guys because since I've done this, you keep me on my fucking toes. I've become a better stand-up. I've become a better man. I've become a better father. I've become a better person all around because you guys keep me on my fucking toes, man. So when you guys come to the shows and give me a hug and you buy a stupid fucking mug or a patch, you let me know that the, the little world that I believe in is still a, it's still around, that there's good fucking people out there. There's people that fucked up and, and now we're scratching to come back. And in the meantime, we're, we're fucking doing all the right things. We put our blinkers on. We make a left or a right. <coughs> we pick up garbage. We pay our taxes. We take the garbage out. You know, these are the fucking things you got to do, man. It's not, Everybody thinks that you have to uh, do all these other things to be successful. And it all starts with little fucking things, man. You know, little things. Being a better friend, torturing Lee, making me an edible every day, making your friends walk, making your friends better. That's what Rogan did. When he opened up the door for us, you know, it's to, for us to be better, man. He he wanted me to be better and Ari to be better and Duncan. And it happened, so now we're opening up the floodgates. And the next one is you, you know. Everybody has, you know, the other day I was talking to Lee how <coughs> I went to get gas at 5 in the morning before I went to the airport. And I saw a guy, maybe 10 years younger than me, maybe 40, pumping gas outside, smoking a cigarette. And as I was pumping the gas, I saw he had two assistants in the truck, two young guys, you know, 18, 19. And they were just sitting there, and they had, both had this look on their face like, what the fuck are we doing here, you know? <laughs> and it's the same look I had on my face when I was that age because you're like, what the fuck am I going to do? Is this my life? Is this my future? 
<clears throat> and you look at the guy that is driving the truck, your crew leader, and this guy is no fucking, uh, you know, this guy's no Einstein. <laughs> and you start looking at him thinking, is this going to be my life? And the guy gets back in the truck and tells you if you work hard, you're going to be able to buy your own house. Look at me. I got a two-bedroom flat. And, you know, and, he, and he's selling you. And you're looking at this guy like, this guy is fucking delusional. But at the same time, he's very proud of what he's done. But we don't look at it that way. We look at it like the guy's a waste of time. He, this guy's been working hard for 20 years. And what does he have? A fucking boat and a fucking house. And he works six days a week. I could sell drugs. I could do this. We always think of the shortcut. <clears throat> I always took the shortcut. I'm not going to lie to nobody. I always thought I could do better than this guy. But I had to sell drugs. Or I had to rob somebody, you know. And it's so weird. I remember that feeling. I was telling, you know, Lee does a podcast about guys that are 25 and under and what they go through. And that's, I think that's the biggest fucking thing is confusion and fear. And I didn't have it because of these guys. I never thought about it because of these guys. These guys were such an effect on me from Roger Holloway. To, I mean, he, he was fearless. I had two guys in my life that did not give a fuck about their surroundings. And they would let you know what was on their mind. And if you crossed them, they would fucking fight you to the end. It was going to be a nightmare for you. One was Roger Holloway, who was no tough guy. And the other one was Mike Ronnie. And I learned from them so much. And this is why I didn't fracture all those years when I was young. I didn't have nothing. And I doubt myself mm -hmm. because of the people I had around me. So I keep them close by because if they help me then, they keep me together now. Even with a little conversation, a little fucking call. You know what I'm saying? So... I'm very proud of that today. But I'm proud of you guys. Thank you for all the love you give me and the respect. And Lee, <clears throat> it's amazing. Lee can never be a racist. <clears throat> Every fucking city I go to, there's always the biggest, blackest guy comes up to me and says, where's Mo fucking Lee? <laughs> it is amazing. I, I had three it. fucking doors. I had three black doors come up to me in Baltimore asking me about fucking Lee. Where's Lee at? Where's Lee at? People always ask me where Lee at. It's always big, black, burly motherfuckers. I love it. So you couldn't be racist even if you wanted to be no. a sucker. Fucking I mean, what? everyone has... I'm, and I'm, before uh, Timmy called, I was going to ask you, the only time I ever thought about it, and not being racist, but I thought about it with my last girlfriend, I thought about it with Paula, is like when, you, when you're a kid growing up, you never imagine... You always imagine your kids being white. Now, with Paula, my kids aren't going to be... If I have kids with Paula, they're not going to be white. I was, I'm interested in what like your wife thinks... Like, because your wife comes from Tennessee. I don't think she ever thought she was going to be have a kid with a Cuban guy. I don't think her family ever thought that. So I didn't, I'd be interested. To, I don't think she's racist, but I, I can't imagine that's what she imagined. Love is love. Yeah. Love is love, man. You know, and uh, sometimes I see a hot, uh, real Japanese woman with a, a white guy or something. And I giggle and I go, love is love. And love doesn't have color barriers. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, <laughs> What the fuck are you gonna do? Yeah, and I was thinking about because like all these white people are all, all up in arms. I can't believe Donald Sterling, but how many of them, if they brought a Clipper home, like a black guy home, and a, with a white girl, how many of the dads would be like, Ooh. like I mean, it's it that that's that's the only part that annoys me is people. When I said earlier that I think with each generation people are getting less racist, I actually think people are getting just more, they're hiding it more. It's like more PC, because like I I know people from my hometown if like. Like, the girl, like, there's always, like, the, that one white girl who only dates black guys, and it's just, people talk about it, it's just, it's, that's just the world we live in. Like I said, I talk a lot of shit, but I can never be racist just because of my, you know, my admiration for all the different races and what they have to bring to the table, right. what I took from them, what I took from them, what I took from them, you know, I took a lot from black humor, you know, I took a lot from, I take a lot, man, I, I read, and I, I love... So, but I also, before something's sad or something, I always think of a struggle, you know, because I had the same struggle, maybe in my heart, maybe, you know, I, I, for, for, I, I don't know. I, the only time I thought about racism was one time in Jersey, uh, Mr. Fontana, a gym teacher, two kids were talking in Spanish, Peter Jimenez and somebody else, and he made them walk home because he told him this was America. And I remember how the kids reacted, me going home and telling my mother, my mother's like, you know what? I don't, I don't agree with him making the kids walk, but I agree with him for what he said. I understand where it's coming from. You can't be mad at him. He's trying to make you an American and make you better or something. 
So it's how we fucking perceive Was it the it. same gym teacher who Mr. Totoro. Balzana had to go no, beat up? No, I was Mr. Totoro. And that was two incidents. <laughs> and I got to tell you something, guys. Those are the only two incidents I've had in my life. And that's why I don't let racism affect me. I don't let racism bother me. When I see it, it bothers me. But what the fuck are you going to do? If you leave the house thinking that all these people you come in contact with are not racist, you got a big fucking surprise coming to you. Yeah. You know, you got to assume that 50% of the people walking around are two-faced motherfuckers. Two-faced motherfuckers. 50%. And I'm being generous on that number. I'm talking about people who don't like you and will smoke your weed. People, you know, I was not raised to be that way. I would, if I didn't like you, I had a problem with you. I stayed the fuck away from you. I don't hang out with you. He's having a party. You don't say nothing. He's got tons of money. Let's go. You're like, why well, do I don't fucking like Hindus? Who cares? He'll cover his feet. You won't see his toes. He's got tons of money. No. He'll cover his feet. <clears throat> you know, I'm just saying. I'm just making a fucking example here. <laughs> That's how I was raised. If you don't like somebody or you don't like somebody's politics, you stay the fuck away from them. Yeah. But in today's society, people don't give a fuck. People do not give a fuck. You know, I really appreciate the Rogan show the other night. Because there's Joey Diaz fans mm -hmm. and there's people that don't want to talk to me that are Rogan fans. They're too smart. Rogan has a, a section of fans that are just too smart. They just, you know, they're too intelligent. They, 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 they're too fucking smart. They, you know, they think of everything. Well, he gave cat to the coke to the cat. He, he must be a felon. You know, like I said, people are prejudiced of me because I'm a felon. And yeah. when you're a felon, it's just another word for being black. That's why I tell people to stay the fuck black. Because no matter what I do, I always have the stink of a felon on me. Why do you think I never went and did the paperwork to get the felony taken off? I don't give a fuck. Because I could hide it, but it's in my walk. It's in my style. It's who the fuck I am. And I could either hide it and put it away like a shame, like most people in this country do. They're ashamed of the mistakes they've made. I put it out there. So when I say something, you know, you'll go, I know why he said that. I know why he means that. I know where he's coming from. So as far as I'm concerned... I ain't going to no fucking Clipper games either. Fuck him. <laughs> Fuck him. I want to give out some fucking, uh, what were you saying? My you're just not going because it's, it's too expensive. I don't give a fuck. I don't, I don't even fucking like him, but now I don't like him even more. I want to give a shout out to my favorite fucking Chinaman, Chung Kennedy. Last name of Kennedy. I don't know how the fuck that happened. A bad fucking guinea. Zonio. I love you, cocksucker. Jesse in Ontario, thank you for the love. Toxic. Get it together, cocksucker. Toxic is one guy that Hit me up from MSNBC. He's one of those MSNBC guys. He, he was locked up. He came out. He had no money, and I understood. So I sent him a letter and explained to him. The Teflon Jew. I always love you. Oh, shit. Diego Jordan, Ryan Gradsby, and Chris Irent. I love you, motherfuckers. You know, he, the church what's happening now, eating ass in 73. That's our new motto. You understand me? Some people have a motto, 20 million burgers served. I don't give a fuck. I'm just making people fat. The church or what's happening now, eating ass. Since 73, you know, oh. Joey, whose ass did you eat when you were 10? The girl upstairs, Yvette Torres, we used to wake up in the morning, she had hair on her pussy, I didn't, she'd let me smell it and lick it and shit. Not that I ate it the right way, I just looked at it. She had a big bush <laughs> on her pussy. Look at it. I loved it, you understand me? You gotta love that. And let me tell you something for you fucking people in Texas. I love Texas. I love for everything that you stand for. I'm a fat fuck. I belong there. I can't wait to go so I can buy some clothes that fits. <laughs> yeah, because two X in Texas is fucking huge. Oh really? Oh, a two X here. It's like a fucking skinny person. That's how they get you. You buy a two X in fucking Texas. See what it looks like. Looks like a fucking blanket. Oh, oh good. I'll a four X in Texas is like fucking the size of this building. <laughs> it's amazing when you buy clothes in fucking Texas. It's completely fucking bigger. All those numbers they give you at Sears and. And Walmart, those are for European fucking fat people. You understand me? That ain't got fluoride in their system. Okay. That shit down in fucking Texas, you're going to see the clothes they have for fat people. Because when, you, when you're when you fat and you go to fucking Big and Tall, all those stores, and you travel, they, they have your clothes. So when you go to Chicago and you see a fat guy, he's got the same shirt as you want. Okay. You look at each other like two fucking jerk-offs. We've talked about this before. In Texas, they got fat tailors for fat people. You'll get clothes that nobody else in the world has. Oh, shit. But so you were saying about Texas. So I'm not fucking around. <laughs> San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas. I love you guys. If you want to come see me this year, I'd love to see you. Do me a fucking favor. Come to Austin the 15th through the 17th. That's all I'm telling you because I got no other dates in Texas. The Improv, Houston, uh, Dallas ain't going to put me in there. San Antonio hasn't gotten back to us. So it's fucking Austin. So if you haven't fucking seen me all year and you want to have a good time, you want to smoke some vapor hits and eat some pot cookies, and get Lee to fucking give you a back rub, come on down to Austin. That's all I'm saying. 
I'm not even advertising it. I'm just fucking telling you. I don't want to hear you later. When are you coming to Dallas? I ain't coming to fucking Dallas. And I ain't coming to fucking Houston, okay? Right now, it's not in the books. What do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Invent myself there? Get a tent so I can go down there and fazoom myself in? I can't. Austin's where it's at. Not this week, not the week after, but the week after. The flying Jew's coming with me. Fuck. The week This week, I'm in Santa Barbara, Rogan. But the week after that, I'm in Santa Fe at the Camelback fucking casino. 8 o'clock, Saturday night with my man Ari Shafir. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know what I'm saying? What do you want to talk about? What's with the questions? No, I don't know. He gives back ropes too. What? R. Right, Shafir. Jews, no, he Jews give him, he doesn't? No, okay. I don't like when Jews give back ropes. I don't like people rubbing me from behind. You know that shit. I told you already. And I know, know who I just noticed? And then he didn't ask me to do this or anything. Edwin San Juan's in the, the Pachanga Comedy Club this this weekend, May 2nd and 3rd. Because I, I was just looking at his Twitter. and Down again, no. of, what do you press some buttons for? Well, mind you, what's the question? That's my whole thing. I press buttons. Well, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to find the last two minutes of Dogs by Pink Floyd. That's the anthem of the day today. I want to give some shout outs to my fucking tremendous sponsors. On it, that's always there for me. On it.com has been there since the beginning. I didn't know what they were about. Joe Rogan sold them to me a little bit, told me about them. Then I started taking on it. I'll tell you what, the Alpha Brain, thank you for that. The turnaround 180s, if you fly a lot, if you're a businessman and you fly a lot, and you don't want that that little last bit, people call it jet lag, I don't know what the fuck it is, but you get that little last bit of tiredness you can't shake, drink a 180 or change your whole fucking life. Protein, the hemp protein, you can't fucking beat it, 16 grams of protein, it tastes delicious. I like the chocolate, but the acai vanilla is not bad either. Go with the chocolate, fucking tremendous. You won't shit blood. You Have throw you mixed some... it? Yeah. No, no, I've never missed it. Oh, you should mix it. I like, like a black, black and white. Yeah. I don't know how it would taste. I don't know if the thing would blow up. It's <laughs> protein powder. Next thing you know, I'm missing a finger like fucking <laughs> some fucking Arab guy because I'm mixing fucking protein powders and shit. My point is, Anna is there to take care of you. They have a money-back guarantee. They have digestive enzymes. They've got kettlebells. Do me a favor. Just go to on it and look at the webpage. I don't even know what's in the Shroom Tech Sport, which I don't know fat fuck gives me an extra 20 minutes. I'm sore the next day and there's nothing you can do. That's why you pop the strong bone or you drink the fucking whatever else they have for soreness. But as far as energy, real fucking energy, <clears throat> long energy, not you're going to be jittery and shit like that, the Shroom Tech Sport, I can't fucking push it enough. And the Shroom Tech Immune, if you fly a lot, or if you're in weird situations, you're a coach, you're around a lot of kids. When you're around a lot of kids, it smells like the fucking flu. Don't be that motherfucker. Take Shroom Tech Sport. All right? Go to Onnit. Go to Onnit.com if you like on your own. Look around what they have. If you're going to order something, go to JoeyDiaz.net. See if I'm going to be in your town. And put what in the box? Church. Church. C-H-U-R-C-H in the box. And you get 10% off. Look into the Stay On It program. They'll mail you the stuff to your house at the first every month. Like Thursday... You'll get a whole new fucking batch of whatever the fuck you're doing, and they'll send it right to your house, and you get 20 and I'm giving you 10 extra for doing that. Go to Onnit.com today. See what they got to offer you. You're not going to be sorry. From kettlebells to battle ropes to fucking grenades, Onnit does it all. Hulu Plus, you know what, man? Again, every week I get emails from people. This week I answered 92 fucking emails. That was the most in about three or four weeks. Wow. And I got to tell you, five of those emails were people thanking me. They're about Dollar Shave Club. Or Hulu Plus. They didn't know about it. You know, I didn't know about things like Hulu Plus. Lee used to tell me about all the other co companies. But once Hulu Plus looked into us and we looked into them, we love it. They got shows that kill. It's not Hulu.com. It's Hulu Plus for a fucking reason. They got your favorite shows. Shark Tank. Daily Show. They got shows you want to binge. You want to catch up on stuff. <clears throat> you know, some people work all fucking day. They ain't got time to watch TV every night. But Sunday, you want to smoke 15 joints and watch six episodes. Hulu Plus has that for you. Right. It's for people who want to binge and hang out. And here's what the beauty is. It's seven ninety nine a month. You think that. You compare that to the rest of the shit that's going on in your life. seven ninety nine a month. That's $2 a week to watch 20,000 fucking shows, games, documentaries, movies. Go to HuluPlus.com. Go to JoeyDiaz.net. Go to Hulu Plus Box and press in. Joey. Boom. J-O-E-Y. Get two weeks gratis. 
boom, on the fucking arm. Who gives you that off the bat? You ever go buy weed? The guy gives you a joint and says, try that and come back later. No, fuck no. You got to pay up front. No money, no ticket, no sucky, no fucky. That's how it is old school. The same thing with Hulu Plus, but they give you two weeks for free. Check into Hulu Plus right now. Joey Diaz. What's in the box, brother? Joey. Joey, J-O-E-Y. Same thing with Dollar Shave Club. Like I said, every couple of weeks, I get a bunch of emails, people thanking me. They didn't know. They didn't know. They didn't know. Well, now you know. For a dollar, six dollars, and nine dollars, you get tremendous fucking razors sent to your home. You don't got to leave. You don't got to go to the store. You don't got to go to 7-Eleven and smell fucking Hindu toes. You don't got to do none of that shit. You go to fucking HuluPlus.com. What are you pressing the box? Church. Church. C-H-U-R-C-H. And you get the deal of a lifetime. You either get razors for a dollar, six dollars, or nine dollars a month. $6 a month is a great package. You get one stem sent to your house. It's harder than fucking hell. Then they send you two razors, double fucking blades. You understand me? What, Lee, what are you looking at? You're all hypnotized. I got that type of fucking animal magnetism, kind of sucker. So, you get... <laughs> what are you confusing me for? Well, when, I look, when I look at the screen, I should be looking at a you. A dollar, six dollars, and nine dollars. Plus, they got one white Charlie's for your asshole. Ooh. Let's say, like, I got the one white Charlie's. Let's say, hey, Pete, I want my dick to smell like peppermint. I pull the skin back. I fucking massage that helmet with this one ship, one strip Charlie. When I'm on a plane three hours later, I want to smell my dick to make sure it don't smell like dead pee. It smells like a lifesaver. You understand me? A peppermint life. You, your dick ever smell like a lifesaver? No, because no. you don't use one white Charlie's but on your dick. I also don't smell my dick on a plane. You so. got to sniff it because you're sitting there. The air gets down. <laughs> it gets trapped. It's like a tunnel. You got to sniff your balls. You got to go in there. I go in the bathroom and open my zipper. But, then, it, but then you know what you should do? You should take one white Charlie's on the plane with you. Because what if you you scratching down there and then your hand smells like dick for the rest of the flight? If my hands smell like dick, they smell like dick. I leave it. Oh, no, that's the worst because the, the air circulates. Who gives you a gotta fuck? Wobble, you, I want you people take to smell my Charlie's, balls. I want, people wipe... to know, I want people to know what time it is. When I scratch my balls, I go like that with my fingers. Oh. And I'm not talking about cash. I'm talking about get the whiff of that in this fucking main cabin, cocksucker. Oh, and the air, the air circulates. That has to stink for fucking... No, my balls oh. don't stink like a Billy yes, Goat, cocksucker. Do. No, they don't because I stay on them. I wash them in the morning. I wash them in the afternoon. I wash them at night. I don't let the stink develop. I don't let that fo- fo- uh, that fucking uh, skitut juice, whatever, staminka juice pack up. It's the staminka juice when you whack off. It, some goes in your underwear. Some goes on her monkey. But the other one stays on your helmet. You don't wash you it. You whack off with underwear on? Wait, what? You whack off with underwear on? I whack off with anything on. Boots, <laughs> fucking whatever. You got to do what you got to do when you're a pimp in heat. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, go to fucking Dollar <laughs> Shave Club. A dollar, six dollars. Press in the box. Church. Church. C-H-U-R-C-H. <laughs> and get your razors sent to your house. Now you go, Joey, I got movies. I got on it. I'm healthy. And I got fucking razors. What do I do now? Jump in a deprivation tank and get your fucking head together. Escape pod dot tank. They've been with me for three months. Escape These motherfuckers. Escape pod tank. Dot com. These motherfuckers don't fuck around. They got commercial tanks. They got residential tanks. And you know what? You know where it gets better? They come to your house. They deliver it. They can save you $2,000 to $3,000 on tanks. I've spoken to people. Customer service supreme. You call Jeremy on the 1-800 line. He picks it up like a fucking soldier. Hello. And he speaks English. This ain't no, no hablo motherfucker with some fucking accent from another country. Jeremy is fucking American as can be. In his house, he's got a picture of fucking Kennedy with a bullet going through his head. That's a fucking American right there. Go to escapepodtank.com, correct? Correct. So what the fuck are you correcting me for? Escapepodtank.com. Because you said escapepodtank. Whatever the fuck. I smoked a couple of fucking vapors this morning. What are you confusing me for? Escapepodtank.com for all your fucking deprivation tank needs. They have commercial ones, residential. Just go to the webpage. See what they got. Look around. Ask questions. Why fucking go and soak with other people who don't wash their ass? They got fungi feet. You know, their breath smells like dick when you can do it at your own house with your own water. Go look into it. EscapePodTank.com. All right, Cox. All right. What, 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 Lee? What the fuck is your, your problem? Your balls stink. I know, I know right now, but I can't I can't believe we say your balls don't stink. I wash them, Lee. I stay on top of them. Yeah, the but if you, if, you, if you scratch on an airplane, that I doesn't smell I guarantee I scratch my nuts right now. I'll let you sniff them. They smell like Irish Spring. What do you want to make a bet? Because I always spring these motherfuckers to no. death. You don't I, wear underwear. It's all hot in there. No, it's not. Listen yes. to what I do. I wash my balls with three different things. I got Irish spring. Okay. Then I got the loofah. 
yeah. with the coconut thing, and I scrub them with that, and I scrub my asshole to get all the barnacles away so I don't have no waste back there. Okay. Then I wash it, then I hit it again. I do my face with the loofah to get the dead skin. You do your ass first? Yeah, who gives a fuck? Oh, it's still no. the same skin. Some people do plastic surgery. Some people borrow the skin from their ass. I take the skin cells and put them on my face. You know what I'm saying? You got to think, Lee. I'm thinking. You got to think about what would a Jew do? That's what he'd do. He wouldn't waste fucking skin cells. He put them on his face to no, the you, surface. You do everything it. first. And you I do that, it and you then do that area soap, last. And I put this fucking cream thing and I, I take my fucking soap in my hands and I get in there with those fucking nuts and then I get the washcloth and I wash the corners. I take the washcloth and I put like a finger up my ass like an <laughs> inch. And you hear an it, you inch? Know, like an inch. It goes just a little. Look, this is an inch right here. You take that washcloth and you lift around, and now everything's fresh down there. So the next two showers, I, bro, I like showers because that I know my balls stink. I'm the first one to be honest with you, and yeah. my, but I control them. Got to control them, Lee, okay? Yeah, you control them. You take one bath a day. Yeah. You, you can't do that, Lee. Your ass stinks like death, and when you wake up, you don't take a shower, which means that you have that dead ass that cultivates in that fucking anal cavity eight hours while you're sleeping on that fucking bed. When you wake up in the morning, the first thing you fucking do is while you're pissing is you turn that water on. Mm-hmm. That's what normal I do people, normally. When I, when I have to come here, I do no, that, That's when you do it even more. Ugh. You get up 15 minutes earlier and you soak that water. 15 minutes? Yeah, you're in there 15 minutes at the hottest water possible. Ooh. And 10 of those minutes, it's pointing at your fucking thing with steam coming out of your nutsack. No, I was saying 20. I, I like 20 minutes. Whatever, 20, 15. You know what I'm fucking saying? Yeah. You got to make time for this. Cleanliness is next to godliness. God will not yet let you into the eternal flames of death, hell, whatever, unless your balls are fucking washed. You cannot have a girlfriend if your balls are not clean. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. No, no, you fucking go all day, and then you pick up at five with that stinky nuts. No, 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 no. You gotta, and then when you come home from that drive to fucking Compton, wherever you go to pick her up, yeah. while she's on the couch, you have to excuse yourself and wash that ass again. That ass is cultivated. You've been sitting on that seat, the ass is, you're farting, it goes into the seat and back up into your fucking ass. How many times are you supposed to shower a day? Three. No. Yes. Three. Three. That's a lot of showers. That, what are you going to do? You want to be clean. Or you want to be like the rest of these fucking maggots walking around. You ever smell somebody, bro? Oh, yeah, of course. You want to smell like that? No. Then you got to be washed. Three showers. Three showers. You're a chubby dude. You yeah. release odors like me. Yeah. You ever smell your shirts at the end of the day? It smell like cheeseburgers and <laughs> fucking Subway sandwiches. You think that's because uh, it's the no? Because it comes out of our system. You don't want to work out every day, so when you sweat, that shit, that top sweat. What do you think that smells like? Onions and that hummus. Where do you think that goes? I don't know. What if you think that stink Does fucking it, goes? Com- comes out in the sweat. Comes out of your sweat. Oh wow! And it goes into your clothes. Now you go and take that shirt off, put it down, and then you sit there and go, "Well, oh, I didn't do nothing yesterday. I'm gonna put that motherfucker back." Oh on. no, no. You know what that shirt smells like after what? that? And then you try to tie... Do you ever smell somebody with sweat on their shirt and they put cologne on top of oh, sweat? no, that's right. We have friends that fucking do that. I don't want them around when they do that shit. They smell like vomit. You gotta wash. You want? You don't want no problems? Take three showers a day. You know what I will do sometimes? What will you do? I will change underwear halfway through the day. Sometimes. Oh, that's great. Not wash your asshole. That's great. So keep the stink and you're gonna transfer the fucking addiction to a new pair of underwear. Yeah. Listen... There's nothing better you're than a fresh pair of underwear. You're making me sick. Well, you got to wash your balls to put a fresh pair of underwear on. How can you not wash? How much time to wash three times a day? You got to make time. This life is about making time if you want to get forward. You got to make time to work out. You got to make time. You know what? I fucking hate drinking those protein shakes. But today, on the way back, I got to stop at the protein store and get protein powder and, and the fucking thing to put in there. I hate it. It's $55 out of my pocket. But I have to do it. These are the things you have to do in your life. You have to work on it. This shit just isn't going to appear. You That's ha- true. And these are all things that step into you being a better person. You start wake up in the morning, you throw that hot water on. While you're getting your shoes, that fucking shower is burning. Oh, well, Joey, the water is low. I don't give a fuck. Put that, I pay for it, all right? I pay for that fucking water. Put that fucking water on. You put that fucking water on, it's burning. You lay your socks on, you look at your shoes, you clean the dog shit off them, you put your pants down, you put the shirt to match while you're in there. You go in there, you take the fucking razor, and you shave the top off over here so this is even. You do the rest of the shave in that fucking shower. So it's one-stop shopping. My shower is one-stop shopping. As soon as I go in the shower, that hot water hits me. I wash my fucking hair. I take the fucking thing and I wash. That's the first wash. Boom, the ass, the ball. And this is all three times I do this, not just once. The balls, the feet, the skin, everything. Between the fucking toes. You don't ever want to release those axles, those hummus toxins in the fucking air that no. come out of your ass. 
Then you put conditioner in your hair. While the conditioner is in your hair settling, you get the fucking shaving cream and you put it on your face, nice in the shower, and you blast off in there with that steam. So it's very nice. You follow me? By that time, all those barnacles off your asshole yeah. from you eating McDonald's all those years, they're starting to melt from the fucking heat. Barnacles? Now, yeah. Now you get... Go ahead. Take your finger like this. Get a finger now and scrape around your asshole. See that green stuff that comes off? Those are barnacles. There's no we, green stuff? Yeah, you have them because you eat garbage. You take that loofah and you scrub again. That's the second bathing. Now you get on there and that condition that's in your hair, you've worked it. You shaved already. It's been there for four or five minutes. Bang! You do that one again. Then you condition it again and hit it with the fucking Irish Spring so you confuse people. They don't know whether you're loofing it or fucking Irish Spring in it because the Irish Spring smells wears off and now the coconut is in there. Oh, I see. You follow me? You come out, you dry your feet, you dry your legs, you dry you, t you dry your balls real good because when you leave that moisture in there, that's that more oh, yeah. you do. You gotta, then you take that powder like your life. And, oh, I love the powder. You hit that motherfucker and all the smoke. And do you ever feel weird getting the powder? No, I love it. You take and you pop it in your ass. When you take a shit, it's oh, like yeah. a little concrete. Oh, yeah, the yeah, first yeah. inch got like a ring around <laughs> yeah, like a cigar. You understand me? These are things you gotta do as a human being. To get to point B, if you're not washing your ass or your pussy, how are you gonna do anything in your fucking life? Exactly. How are you gonna do anything? You you arguing with me about three shots? I'm arguing like with you. You gotta make time. Do you get do you get the baby? Oh, you must. Oh, you're I lucky. Do everything. You have a baby. I don't, you, I don't have a baby. Every time I go to the store, I get the big powders and I get a bunch of baby wipes. I fuck. I feel Tremendous. like a, I feel like a weirdo. But you gotta take three showers a day. Nobody wants to hang around with stinky people. Nobody. Right. They're your friends, and they gotta smell you. And go, what the fuck? Why does this guy always smell like an olive? <laughs> Why does he always smell like he jumped just um, jumped into a Greek salad? That's true. Godliness is next to cleanliness. Did you find dogs for me? The last two minutes of it? Yeah. Let yeah. me see what you got. Fast forward and more. More? Okay. Back a little bit. Ten seconds. Stop it. Stop. I love you motherfuckers. The church, April 28th. Sometimes we end with the national anthem and I go bananas. We're going to end with the fucking song Dogs. The last two minutes of Dogs. It's tremendous. They drop it on you. You understand me? Who was brought in a house full of pain? Who was taught not to spit? In the fan. We're going to drop it on you motherfuckers. Thank you for listening to the podcast. We got the live podcast Wednesday night at the Ice House. 8 o'clock. We have a tremendous guest. I don't know who it is yet. But we're going to have a tremendous <laughs> fucking guest. And if not, it's me, myself, and fucking my brother, little Lisa yet. Thank you very much. I want to thank my sponsors on it. Shave Club, Hulu, Hulu Escape, Bodtank.com. I love you motherfuckers. I love Chung King. I love everybody who listens to the podcast. And thank you for all the love and support. You've given the podcast over the last year. I hope you it. Thank you very much. Stay black and have a fucking great day. Don't let nobody fuck with you. Now that the show is over, and don't forget. Donald Sterling to suck your dick. Don't worry about it. You got a, you got a job to do. Fuck Donald Sterling. <laughs> don't forget to sign up for your free trial of Hulu Plus. Hulu Plus lets you binge on thousands of hit shows anytime, anywhere on your TV, PC, smartphone, or tablet. Support this podcast and get an extended free trial of Hulu Plus when you go to HuluPlus.com slash Joey or go to joeydiaz.net and click on the Hulu Plus banner. And don't forget to sign up for dollshaveclub.com. Get high-quality razors sent to your door every month for a fraction of what you pay at retail. Now go to dollshaveclub.com forward slash church or go to joeydiaz.net and click on the Dollar Shave Club.